I mean, I think service is, it, look, it's all, it comes back to what we talked about, which is value to the end user, right? It's finding out how to identify what your consumer needs and then service those needs. And if you service those needs appropriately at whatever price, they're going to come back to you and, and request more of that service. Because look, at the end of the day, we're all, we're all here for a couple of reasons, right? Like whether or not you're a service-based business, you're a product-based business, I would argue that we're all here with one goal, which is that one consumer that we are selling that one product to, whether or not it's instructional, informational, or hardware and software, we have to fulfill some need in their life and solve some sort of a problem. Welcome to Barbell Business. I'm Mike Bledsoe here with Doug Larson, Marcus Gersey, and we have our guest, Eric Glatter, uh, founder of PowerDot. Uh, today we're going to be talking about, uh, I have no idea because these guys planned it without me. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need you for this anymore. <clears throat> we yeah, got this. Yeah, so what are we talking about, guys? I, oh. I was too busy in the corner. Uh, I actually got into some really good discussions with Eric around around creating value for customers, which I, I think we... We've certainly touched on many times before, but but your your perspective was uh, was very clear, and so I, I'd like to actually dive into that first around like the product specifically and how like the whole the whole mission on the front end was just creating as much value as possible with the with the creation of of the Power Dot product. Sure, no problem. Um, so the the concept is look, we all kind of started in the CrossFit community, mm -hmm. functional fitness. I think if you started on early, like in the two thousand like two thousand five two thousand seven. Mm -hmm. We kind of saw the community grow and, uh, you know, saw Spieler out there with paleo packs, handing them to kids in third world countries, teaching them how to squat. And so there's a certain love and appreciation for the community um, that, that we have, our company has. And so um, when you talk about value, and I think it, it has to come from the standpoint that you understand the consumer and what they're looking for. And, you know, when we kind of conceptualized PowerDot and, and, and the company and the brand and, and kind of the product our DNA basically was how do we take technology and the growth in technology and how do we utilize that to make our therapy more affordable to the end user? And more importantly, how do we create an ecosystem through an iOS Android device where we can continually kind of upgrade that, that user's performance? Mm -hmm. So it's not just a one purchase, one off. We're constantly in communication with that end user. So as we develop more functionality within the app or or within the device itself, we can push that out to the user so they actually get long-term value. And I think that kind of comes into play where, with, when we were having the conversation earlier, which is, you know, I think the, the community that we work in and the fitness community, um, you know, like the 80s and 90s, we talked about this this morning at breakfast, you know, it, it's kind of gone through a little bit of a transition where I think folks have gone from that before and after photo, and that's the way they perceive fitness. I think mm -hmm. they've now expanded the point A to point B. And what it's really about is about the journey. And as a company that's bringing out a product to facilitate that journey for folks, you want to be part of that vernacular. And, 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 and part of that means that you've got to be able to provide that value. You have to fit into people's ecosystem. And by helping people achieve that the goals during that journey, I think that's where you have the true connection with the consumer. And, you know, that's for us, our main focus. Like we're not looking at margins. We're not looking at some of these other things. Our focus is to, to, to produ produce more product at a much more affordable price to that end user because we want to become a part of that journey. And when we do that with enough people, we think that effectively we'll see growth without having to force it too hard. So that's when we... When we really push for that value, I think that's what we're looking for. Awesome. Now, what what is it about PowerDot that makes it unique? I know you guys are the first, like, phone-based. You guys, What you were talking about at breakfast with the computer and kind of replacing it with the one that you already have, which is more powerful anyway. Yeah. Go into that a little bit. So, I mean, look, STEM has been around since the, the late 80s, 90s, uh, really kind of started in, with Russian STEM back in the day. And then guys in the United States started using it like Charlie Francis. And you can talk to John Wellborn about him and Charlie Francis and how 
they utilized stem to uh, kind of force adaptation of muscle. So depending whether or not it was type one or type two or type two AB, really stem is kind of the first real biohack, if well, you will. John was using it while squatting, like throw it on his legs and then squat while yeah, while so shock. Well, yeah, yeah. So they would actually do it where and and. John and his team are a little crazy, but they would actually put on the stem, force a contraction, and then actually do a squat against the contraction. So concentric and eccentric at the same time, creating that elongated muscle fiber. And where that came from was Charlie Francis back in the day would just have guys go hammer out 400-meter sprints. And as soon as they were done, they'd wheel out this big stem machine, and they'd put electrodes on, and they'd fire those muscles as hard as they possibly could. Well, what he was trying to do was capture people in that adaptation phase, force a full muscle contraction. So when your body is looking for ways to become efficient, you're lighting up all the pathways and the body goes, wait, I have access to all this. So when you talk about biohacking and all these things, it was really kind of the first big biohack. It's like, how do you trick the body to become more efficient? And that's kind of where STEM came in. So STEM forever has been in, in, in you know, therapy rooms, NFL, NHL, MLB, anyone that's looking for performance. If you go to your chiropractor, ART or physio, you're probably getting some form of STEM. Mm -hmm. And it's then been there for recovery, but what we're really tapping into now is, is kind of the performance aspect. So when you talk about what's different about, different about PowerDot and what we've done is, what we've just tried to do is make it easier for the end user to get access. And you know, we started with machines that Bruce Lee used to have on his body, and they were these massive machines that were tens of thousands of dollars. And then, you know, over time, there were companies that started refining that technology down and got really good at what they were doing. And, um, and, and, and started making devices that were a little more available to the consumer. So you've got your Compexes of the world, you've got your Mark Pros of the world, both solid technology, and they, they took that next step to make it smaller. What PowerDot has done is we've just taken the next evolutionary step, which is taking that technology and shrinking it even further. But more importantly, it's we're taking it and shrinking it further, and we're, we're analyzing the consumer ecosystem and saying, what are the things that they already have that we can tap into? So we don't have to sell you more stuff. And in turn, we can provide you that same value without having, you without having to have you double pay for things. Mm -hmm. We all have enough PCB boards in our pockets, right? We all have enough computers. We don't need another one. So what we did was just leverage the most powerful computer that everyone uses, which is their phone. And we opened up that ecosystem. And basically, it's the first time your phone can have a physical effect on your body, which is actually you know, kind of an interesting thing. We're taking that ecosystem and we're expanding it. And when you look at where... Um, when you look at where wearable tech is going, you know this whole idea of telept and teletherapy in a world of ACA and where healthcare is just going crazy. Um, we're really opening the door to letting your phone be the gateway to that first line of defense for ART, Cairo, physio. Eventually, we'll get into the medical side and musculoskeletal, but right now we're focusing on the consumer space. Mm -hmm. So we kind of jumped into to talking about value, but we didn't really talk about your background. Like, how did you get into this? Like, like what was your upbringing around being an entrepreneur and in business? <laughs> so I grew up in. Uh, my dad always apologizes to me, but I grew up in, in Silicon Valley during the heyday. So when I was there, I'm a little older. I'm 41. I've got the grades to show it. Um, when I was there, it was mostly orchards. So it was a very, very different Silicon Valley than than you know today. Mm -hmm. um, but my father and a bunch of his friends were always doing startups from the very early time, you know, when I was really young, you know, my brothers and I were rolling around on pallet jacks in the back of my dad's warehouses where they were building, you know, high resolution imaging before it ever was in a computer and they were doing stuff for the government. And, you know, some of the things that they were working on were huge successes. Some of the things were massive failures. So I grew up in kind of a world of watching technology start up and kind of being there and, and, you know, I think it's kind of in my DNA that I kind of want want to be in that constant startup chaos. It's, you know, my father kind of looked at me and he's like, hey, dude, you just appreciate the clusterfuck. That's that's what it is. Like day in and day out, you have to be ready for it. And it's just being responsive and just, you know, again, it's the startup journey is different than most. Like you have to have the sand to deal with it. Um, but yeah, that's my background. I grew up in it. So it's in my DNA. So are you someone who feels like you you thrive in the startup phase and then once the company gets to a certain size you're kind of like ah, i'm not really interested anymore i want to find the next new thing to get off the ground is that more your style or do you do you like when a company that like, grows to like uh an established size and then you're kind of just doing the same thing so to speak for a while i, I like being in the trenches like being in the trenches and creating the spark and watching the smoke and watching the evolution and 
taking an idea from infancy and, and, you know, every once in a while, I think you have to take stock in what you've done. Cause I don't think people do that enough. But if, if I think about what we've done in five months with, with power dot, it, it, it's pretty incredible. We've gone from, you know, zero to 800 miles an hour. Um, but it's understanding those pieces. And I think it's the small wins are the things that kind of give me the jolt. It's like, Oh my God, we did this today. Right. Like mm -hmm. it's, 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 you know, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> I'll, t I'll tell you a story. Um, so the scariest day of PowerDot was when we decided that we were going to um, procure the technology from a group out of Singapore. And there's two Russian guys in Singapore. One's name, one, one's name is Alexei, and the other is Yegor. And we hadn't met them face to face, but we knew that there were other people, you know, looking at the technology. And we just said we, we really think we're the right team for it. And there was a day where we just cut a pretty big check to to put the two companies together and i don't know if you guys have ever sent a big check to two russians in singapore so i don't see um, no, i'm never gonna see no. that money it, again it, <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah it was one of the longer days that we've had but the next day i got a phone call from the from alexi and he's like hey wire hit we're sending some product your way let's let's have, let's set up a meeting so um <laughs> I didn't tell my wife about that that day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but cocaine yeah. will be here soon, honey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's it's one of those stories where... <laughs> you think you're making one deal? <laughs> but it's a totally different deal. He's like, oh, I thought we were talking in code the whole time. He's like, oh, I actually want East Like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, it's just... It's a, it's appreciating the risk, I think. And mm -hmm. there's people that like the risk. There's people that are more comfortable and more structure. I'm not necessarily comfortable in that much structure. I kind of like I kind of like the risk a little bit. Mm -hmm. so, so, what does your team look like right now? Like how I know you guys you guys have a beautiful app, you have great hardware, you have a, a fucking rocking website. Like you guys build all that internally, or do you farm that out, or how does that work? So yeah, so um, a lot of the work is done here, and then we actually send it over to our team in Singapore to actually do the execution. So mm -hmm. um, when we first got the device, the app was very very two dimensional, not very consumer friendly, and so. Um, you know, the first iteration of the app, we had an app update about two months ago um, that was a massive undertaking in three months. Like, we completely, you know, redid the entire thing. It's it's the equivalent of getting a, uh, like, an old Bronco, and it's all rusted out. And, like, we literally polished it, put a new engine in, and, and put the whole thing together and, and put it back out there. We had to deal with a lot of a lot of bugs. Um, you know, one of the things that we, we, we are finding with the apps is, you know, with iOS in particular, and then Android is, you know, Salesforce has just dropped their app from Android. And there's a reason for it. Well, not from Android, but from various phones on Android. It's because you're dealing with all these different platforms. And iOS is a little different, um, especially when you're dealing with a Bluetooth device. So iOS just had their latest update, and everything got messed up on Bluetooth. So mm -hmm. Apple Car, all these things. No one knew about it, so our, cons our, our, our call center was just blowing up, going, oh, no. our devices aren't connecting. And But if you go look at the app, so we had to move like within 24 hours to have a fix. We had the fix out there in 24 hours. And you know these are the types of things that you learn quick, like living in an app-based environment. When yeah. Apple or Android decides to make a change, mm -hmm. you need to be ready for a little bit of turbulence. Yeah. And so we've got a really crack team down in Singapore um, that, that is now on that. We've got about six guys down there developing. Mm -hmm. um, we've got an industrial designer, and then Alex is kind of our, uh, our, our, our chief innovation officer. So he does all the hardware spec and software spec, firmware, and the actual device. And uh, what's interesting about Alex is his father was the, forf was the foremost authority in Russian STEM back in the 80s and 90s. Mm. Alex happened to be a guy who was building the back ends for all the major banks in Singapore. So he took his software knowledge and his dad's hardware knowledge and put it together and created what we think is probably the best STEM device in the market right now. Wow. Yep. Now, what you guys have done from like the units themselves, you guys have made these like really powerful, small units. Can you break that down a little bit? You teased it a little bit before we got started, but like, how does that all work? How did you guys make that all into one small device? So Alex and his team were working with you know, they were working with a traditionally a bigger pod. And so they started really refining down some of the battery power. And, and, and we knew what we wanted to get out of the device. Um, you know, we knew that there was a certain power range that most consumers could benefit from. So we focused on the battery and really focused on making sure the engineering was right and all the pieces. But the device itself can get to 120 hertz, which means you can actually get to that type 2B muscle fiber. You can get that hard contraction. It goes to 100. I know Mike's been using the device quite a bit, but you know, once you're up in the 40s, like 
it's it's causing a pretty big contraction. So the little pods are, 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 are pretty powerful and pretty potent. Um, I haven't gotten it to a hundred yet. I have. It's it's good. <laughs> it's good. It's it's you gotta you gotta build your way up, but you know you gotta <laughs> test it on everything and 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 uh, it's it's pretty powerful. But our whole thing was we could go super powerful and add more battery and go up to that you know 170 180 hertz. But most consumers don't go there. And when we were when we were building this, it was like, how do we get the biggest bang? into this device and still make it affordable to the end user. And, you know, bells and whistles are neat, but unless the end user has a need for it, don't build it in. All it is going to do is create additional cost and it doesn't make any sense. So so we've really tried to make sure that when we look at the consumer need and what we're trying to service, we streamline it. We don't add a whole lot of bells and whistles. It's let's just create that service, let's open it up and let's just give them what they want and then we'll go and build from there. Yeah, I want to point out maybe the, the difference between a product-based business and a service-based business. I think a lot of people who listen to this are in a service-based business. And we also have people who are in a product-based business. Yep. And then there's a difference in, uh, in how to price things mm-hmm. in that case. Yep. A lot of times in a product-based business, the, the name of the game is like how we can make this more affordable. Mm-hmm. And we can drive price down by uh, when there's more volume being produced. Yep. And, sometime, and, and most time in a service-based business, having more volume at a lower price is not the best idea. So I think a lot of people might be in a service-based business. Yep. And I, I guess I want to clear up any confusion and, and how you might want to approach business differently than if you're in a product-based business versus service-based. I mean, I think service is, it's, look, it's all, it comes back to what we talked about, which is value to the end user, right? It's finding out how to identify what your consumer needs and then service those needs. And if you service those needs appropriately at whatever price, they're going to come back to you and, and request more of that service because look at the end of the day we're all we're all here for a couple of reasons right like whether or not you're a service based business you're a product based business i would argue that we're all here with one goal which is that one consumer that we are selling that one product to whether or not it's instructional informational or hardware and software we have to fulfill some need in their life and solve some sort of a problem for us it's we solve the problem of you know, the firing of muscle, some pain, as well as some recovery. It's like, how do you keep people moving without sending them to their physio, their chiro, their ART? And you guys know how much those, those appointments cost. Yeah. yeah like, ultimately, you're saving people a lot of money if they, if they understand how to use the device the way it's supposed to be used. 100%. And you and I talked earlier about, you know, Affordable Care Act. I mean, I'm, I would consider myself pretty middle range in terms of where my income is, but you know, every time I go to the phys- the doctor these days, it's expensive. You know, mm-hmm. and, and those and those numbers stack up. I got a five year old and a three year old. You know, I start taking mm-hmm. them to the pediatrician. Yeah, might as well go buy myself a Honda. Yeah, you know, like it's it's <laughs> it's 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 one of those things. And so, you know, the thing that th- what we wanted to do was provide people a one time purchase where they can get the benefit they would get from a physio, physio, ART, and chiropractor. Mm-hmm. Get that level of care. They can take it anywhere in the world they're at. Make it light, make it portable, make it easy to use so they use it frequently. Mm -hmm. Because, look, at the end of the day, if someone's using STEM on a daily basis, they're going to feel better. Mm -hmm. And if they're feeling better, they're going to project themselves feeling better. They're going to have a better day. Yeah. We've we've helped in that somehow, some way. Yeah. You know, if I provide that at too expensive a service, I may not be able to reach that amount of people. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, we find that right price point. We can help a lot of people, and hopefully, you know, we keep them moving. We keep them in their fitness career longer, just in their health and wellness career longer, or just feeling better for that day. That's what we're looking to do. Yeah. I always thought it would be a good idea for a gym owner to just have, like, you know, a set of, like, you know, five units or so, and then with their competition team or with just with, like, some of the more competitive athletes, like, to, to have, like, I don't know if you call it like a class or, like, practice or something like that, where, like, your, your group comes in and then, and then the coach can say, all right, you know, you, you, you have this issue, you know, put this on right here. You have this issue, put on this other spot. And then you're kind of doing, like, in a group setting – um, using something like like STEM or PowerDot, maybe you have one PT that's like a part of your staff or that's friendly to your gym that can come in and kind of help uh, all the athletes in the gym use the unit, and then the gym just owns the units, and then uh, it's just more value for the athletes in the gym for the gym, for the gym owner. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, at the end of the day, you guys have all been there. You guys were all gym owners, like you guys have seen it. Attrition rates, they're always fluctuating, right? And you've always got that one guy that comes in. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say I'm that guy yet. I'm 41, but that 45 to 50 year old, they come in, they work out, they get hurt. 
they leave for a couple of days and all of a sudden they're off your roster, right? So, yeah. you know, that retention rate is key. And so part of that retention rate comes from being a good coach, being mindful about the movements and making sure they're executing their movements correct, correctly, um, you know, making sure that we're not pushing people beyond that pain threshold. Like if someone has a pain, have them pair back a little bit, make an adjustment, scale the workout. But what's, what's important about that is, you know, you and I talked earlier about the importance of people's experience and how they talk about what they're going through and that idea of journey. You know, going to a gym on a daily basis or going through this, and if you get hurt, you're going to scream that just as loud as the fact that you got fit, right? So the negative yeah. aspects of getting hurt or the neg negative aspe aspects of having delayed onset muscle soreness the next day can have a negative impact on a gym, right? It just depends on how loud the person is that's talking about it. So being mindful of that consumer experience at the gym and as they leave the gym and making sure that their perception of what they're getting from the gym, you know, in, in my world, I think having that one advocate is just as important as having all those advocates because you have enough people speaking your accolades within a small community, that's how people are going to go to your gym. And, mm -hmm. and, and those retention rates, the higher the retention rate within that gym, you typically find a much happier uh, a community there. And, you know, you guys have all been there. Like you've seen the gyms where there's just tons of injuries and all these things. And, you know, it's kind of like, ah, we don't care. And then by the time they're caring, mm -hmm. there's too many people that have left the gym. And it's just like you're already on the downside of that slope, right? Mm -hmm. So it's you either got to take it, do a massive reset and fix or, you know, you close the gym. It's 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 kind of like that. That's the way it would work. Yeah. All right, let's take a break real quick. Uh, when we get back, I want to talk about your entrepreneurial journey a bit. Cool. My name is John Wolf. I'm the chief fitness officer for Onnit Labs, in charge of basically all fitness product development, info product, and education coming out of Onnit. I found the Barbell Mastermind actually initially through their product Barbell Logic. I thought it was just such a beautiful piece of art that they put together and it sparked my curiosity. It's actually what spurred me to reach out to the team, develop that relationship about that, and learn about that product, and then next thing you knew, I was at the Mastermind. It'd be really hard for me to sum up everything I've learned by participating in the Mastermind, but ultimately, it's that we're not alone. As entrepreneurs or business owners, or even executives for other, for other companies, as I find myself in this current state of being, uh, a lot of times we feel as leaders we're alone in our, in our mission and in our problems. And at the Mastermind you find how untrue that is. We're all human beings and we're all here to support each other. This is my second Mastermind in, that I've, I've been lucky enough to attend. And uh, after each one I always feel empowered to go back to my team and to my family with new tools to enrich our lives. And we, we're all sharing the life together. So it's always something that I find those people that I serve appreciate. If you're thinking about attending Barbell Mastermind, like ultimately it's, it's a decision about where you are and where you want to be, and what you're willing to invest in yourself to make that happen. Uh, all the tools, all the resources, and some of the most amazing people I've ever known are here waiting for you. If you are ready to take that step, then they're here to help you. And success is just a byproduct of, of that type of support. And we're back with Eric Ladder from uh, PowerDot. And uh, I was wanting to dig into, I guess, the, the entrepreneurial journey. And the reason I like talking about this with people is no matter where they came from, the lessons seem to be universal, mm -hmm. or at least we can all associate with the pain involved. And I think uh, when I talk to a lot of people who listen to this show, you know, uh, they make comments like, oh, when I listen to this show, I feel like people understand me and there's yep. other people like me. And it might be somebody who lives, you know, in a town where, you know, entrepreneurship's not really a thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's not common. So this is like their only opportunity to feel understood. Yep. So how did you get started in entrepreneurship? Like at what point did you get into business, I guess you could say? I mean, how deep you guys want to go? Did you just knocking on neighbors' doors, charging nickels for, yeah. you know, for, yeah. for firewood that we had out in, in, for in the sure. neighborhood. I, uh, wish I, I wish I was one of those kids that did shit like that. Yeah. I, I hear people talk about stuff like that all the time, and I'm like, man, I didn't do any of that when I was I a totally little kid. Did, shit, yeah. did you? Yeah. 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 Like we, uh, I mean, I'm the youngest of, youngest of three brothers, so you had to pretty much fight for, for everything. And, and, I, and I'm the smallest of three brothers, by the way. Like, my, my oldest brother Jeez. is 6'6", six, six, and he weighs... <laughs> At, at the height, he was probably in the 270s, 280s, so big Dang. big boy. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, you know, there'd be times my mom would actually come home and I'd be hogtied in my own underwear, my two brothers left down there. <laughs> so, like, I had to, like, I had to learn to fight. Like, yeah. I had to learn to, like, you know, like, earn my way. And that was everything from, you know, making sure I got the last glass of milk on the table or, you know, uh, going out and kind of earning our way. And so my dad was always an entrepreneurial guy. Uh, and, and he always kind of encouraged us to go out and do our own thing and, you know, didn't really put a lot of restrictions on us. So sometimes it was good. Sometimes it was bad. Um, there was a time my brother and I, when we were in elementary school and we had a connection to garbage pail kids back in Colorado. And so we were actually buying tons of them from there, bringing them to school and selling them on campus. And we both got suspended because we were making too much money on all the other fourth graders. And so it's kind of always been there. It's like, Hey, how do you take this and, and, and provide that service to someone and then charge them for that service? And, and it, it's kind of always been there. So, um, you know, when I was in college, I, I kind of said, I want to go figure out what drives a market and I want to go figure out what makes a market. And so I created a very specific path. And so I went from University of San Diego, go Toreros down here. Uh, and I ended up moving to New York and I worked for Cantor Fitzgerald, which is a, a big institutional trading house um, in New York City. And so first concept was learn what makes a market. So go trade for an institutional trading house, figure out what creates demand, what, what creates supply. And so we did that for about a year and a half. And then from there, I went back to the Bay Area where my father was working on other companies. And I started working at a, a firm called Wilson, Sonsini, Gerrich and Rosati, which was uh, kind of the premier corporate law firm uh, um, in the Bay Area. And so I went there and I became a paralegal and was like, okay, we see what drives the market. Let's go see how to build a company. And so it was all about corporate structure and corporate financing and figuring those pieces out. And then it was at that time, my father called me up and he said, hey, I'm working on this new project. We're spinning something out. Why don't you come work for us? And so we launched a, a company called Prosera Networks, which was a, a layer seven switching company. So we were looking at bandwidth and we were basically looking at the layer seven of a packet, if you know anything about networking. And we were basically creating pipes within a pipe. And so we, we, we launched that company, um, you know, kind of in the the rough time, right around 2001, 2002. And it was a... Uh, it was a rough time for technology at the time. Everyone was saying, hey, we're going to go fiber optic. And they were laying these massive fiber optic lines. And then the crash came along and everyone went back, everyone went back to dirty Ethernet. And that's kind yeah. of where we cut our teeth was taking Ethernet, Ethernet tubes and doing that. So have played in that space and, and, and have seen the ups and downs. Like when we were at Procera, it was heyday. And then all of a sudden the money was gone. And then we had to survive through it and did a reverse merger. And all of a sudden they ended up selling the company. I think it was like 2007 and 2008 and did pretty well with it. And that's kind of when we started working on, uh, uh, I started working kind of in the, in, in the CrossFit space with some of the guys at Azurex. That's what's interesting with technology is the, uh, you get to see the market change quickly and you, you get to watch it like oh, yeah. shift around you really fast. Whereas a lot of industries um, that still exist, maybe, you know, a beverage, like the, the beverage industry or something like that. It's yep. still slow compared to technology. Um, yeah. So when you look at, like tech like that it's moving so quickly you actually get to witness this whirlwind around you crossfit's kind of the same way like yep. if you were with crossfit from the very beginning mm -hmm. you're oh we got to operate like this for a long time and then three years later if you're still operating the way you were three years ago you're completely screwed yeah whereas some companies can just do what they were doing five years ago and it's still cool but technology is one of those things and then in a in an industry that's as new as say something like crossfit you can't sit still either. You have to be constantly evolving. And I think you bring up a pretty interesting point with regard to technology. My father used to joke around, j joke around with me, which is like, you have to spend the majority of time like looking over your shoulder to see who's coming up on you, right? And I think this is important when you're talking about a product, especially in the tech space. Like, you know, you speak about brand. You guys have built the Barbell Shrug brand, like you know, the Barbell Business brand. Brand is super important because I think brand actually gives you a little bit of buffer in terms of innovation. Yeah. So if you've got good brand, it's going to give you a little more buffer in terms of your innovation side. Um, you know, PowerDot's kind of an interesting place because we're, we're so new that no one really knows the brand, but the technology is there, so we're building it out. But you have to focus on both sides of the business because, you know, I'll tell you, like, in a, like technology's scary. And technology moves so quickly that if you don't have either the resources, the nimbleness, or the time to be looking behind you and making sure you're watching the entire market, mm. it'll sneak up on you and someone will come and take your spot. And, you know, when you've put so much time into something and so much effort, and, and you guys all know, like when you're doing your own startup, I mean, it's 18 hours a day and you can't always just focus on one thing. And we have five people at our, at our office here. We've got four over in our office in Singapore. So we're a pretty, pretty 
lean team and 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 we're stretched on the daily basis yeah so so spending that time to be looking over your shoulder it's a lot so what i would say to kind of entrepreneurs it's you can't just focus on the technology. You got to focus on the brand. And if you focus on the brand and you build enough brand recognition, that'll actually give you some of the buffer because sometimes it's not always about the best innovation. Sometimes it is about the brand. And if you have that, you have the ability to make larger pivots rather than having to move so quickly. Cause mm -hmm. you know, look, when you move quickly, mistakes get made and all sorts of stuff happens, but you make a really interesting point. Like you got to have brand and innovation, but you're right. Technology moves fast and we're, we're, we're doing everything we can to stay ahead of the curve. Yeah. So in 07, you got, was it 07 you were saying you, so, kinda, you went from that technology space into the CrossFit space. 07 is when I kind of stepped away and started working on, in, in, working on a, as a consultant with a couple other groups and then met with Marcus and the guys over at Dynamis and kind of watched what they were doing in the CrossFit space. And it was interesting, like, you know, watching CrossFit kind of blossom from where it was in the functional fitness movement you know the idea that people were more focused on the journey than just like hey i got six pack abs to me it was like that was amazing like there was a time i was up at uh nike years ago and i walked in and i kind of looked at you know i kind of looked at kind of what they were doing and and i was like you guys aren't necessarily making a shoe that i'm that i'm interested in yet and they kind of said you know like when someone really wants to get into not basketball, um, you know, not some of these other things, but really wants to get into like the hardcore non-running fitness where they're lifting, that's when we'll start making a shoe for it. All of a sudden you look at what has happened is CrossFit's come on and now you've got Reebok making the Nano and you've got, you know, yeah. Nike making the Metcon and they're making huge investments into these products. So watching kind of the CrossFit bloom from 2006 to 2007 and kind of what Glassman put together was, you know, taking this functional fitness and putting it in a gym and giving people that ability to compete, you know, there's a desire for that. And I think that, you know, when we saw that happening, it was kind of from a sports marketing standpoint, it was like, hold up, hold on a second. This is a group of people that are working hard. They're going to work on, they're going to spend money on things that help them work hard. And they're going to continue to do it and they're going to talk about it. And you saw that, like, again, with Chris Beeler and those guys, like, traveling the world, like, you know, handing out paleo packs to kids and helping them squat and, like, that whole community. I think they were producing viral content before content was really going viral. And I think, you know, CrossFit in and of itself has had a, has had a huge, you know, on Instagram and these things. I mean, CrossFit has been a major pusher in how Instagram, you know, how Instagram is now a marketing channel because people get to tell the story between point A and point B. And that's just hugely powerful because people are looking for that information. And like with the guys that are doing subscription businesses and, and are pushing out content, like the power of social media and how it's evolved within this community and being able to tell a story visually, especially to this group of people that are constantly looking for information, constantly looking for ways to better themselves. It's just, it's a hugely powerful thing that I don't even think we've scratched the surface on yet. I think it's, I think it's going to continue to grow. I think and it's it, really interesting. Yeah. yeah. I never even thought about that is, is without something like Instagram, you wouldn't really get to witness the journey that because that yep. before that fitness was, this was, this was, you know, today, and and this after. is six months later yep. and you didn't get to see anything in between because who is so uh, narcissistic that they're going to take pictures and put them in magazines every day. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would argue there's now people that are doing it a little too much, but, but, but yeah, but it's like get, getting to be a part of that person's journey and seeing how they're doing it. We used well, it's to a lot less effort, so you're yeah. not nearly as narcissistic. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But we used, to, we used to laugh. Like we, were, we, we used to joke around like in 2007, 2008. I'm like, I think CrossFit is like, CrossFit is, 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 is the Comic-Con of fitness. People work to make more money, to spend more money, to be better at their sport. And if you can be a part of that journey and provide value within that, like there, this is going to be a juggernaut. And I think they've proven it's a juggernaut. And I think, you know, it's, 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 we like it because it's, it's a pivot point. Like I can't go to triathlon and market to anyone else, but I can go to CrossFit and I can market to everyone else because everyone kind of knows functional fitness. Everyone knows the Olympic lifts. And from the standpoint of, putting your product in with this community, it translates across the board to everyone that just wants to move and they want to move to be, to do what they love and be passionate about what they love. And so we're expanding the universe. We've, you know, we started in the CrossFit space. Um, you know, we've got Camille and Josh and, uh, Ashley Horner. And, you know, we, uh, we just got uh, con Porter, uh, and some other folks and just really 
pumped to have those people on board. But we're also picking up other folks. Like we've got working with Robbie Madison. We're working with Mick Fanning. We're working with people that do fitness, but they do fitness so they can do the other things they love. And, you know, we really think that that's going to be the next stepping stone, which is, you know, CrossFit functional fitness will always be the place we cut our teeth, but we do this to be good at other things mm -hmm. and to live our lives to the fullest. And we think that's a super, super important message, you know, over the next couple of years is, you know, using this to do these other things better. Mm -hmm. And we want to be a part of that journey in, in people's lives. For sure. I, I think that's the evolution that we're all kind of yeah. aware of now yep. is that it's no longer just CrossFit for CrossFit. It's now everyone understanding its place in the bigger picture of sport and whatever their application is yep. and how that's really kind of the evolution. This has become kind of the gold standard now of kind of strength, conditioning, and preparation for whatever it is that you want to do because it is about balance. It is about, you know, the, the using the whole body and understanding, you know, holistic movement, wellness, yep. the entire equation because that then transits into whatever you want it to. Yep. So that's a movement we see in the gyms, we see in just how in products and all that. That's definitely where I think personally where it's moving. And I think it's 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 in the statements were in no way put out there to like demean what CrossFit is doing. In fact, I think it's there to empower CrossFit becomes or functional fitness becomes the foundation from, for sure. from which we step. Mm -hmm. And as a coach or someone that's actually providing that service, you are providing people that foundation. Mm -hmm. And in providing that founda that, that foundation to people, they're always going to look back at you and say I look back at my first CrossFit gym and the first time I had that experience and I look back at it as like, that was a pivotal, pivotal time in my life. Mm -hmm. It changed the way I saw fitness and it changed the way I, I, I did it in doing so I got fitter than I was ever, than I was in high school. And you know, it changed the way I approached each day. And it was like, I can do more. I can do it stronger. I can do it longer. I can, I can literally go out and, and be more successful with all these other things. And so when we talk about it, it's, it's, it becomes a foundation, which is a hugely powerful thing, especially in the, in the consumer space. Yeah, people talk a lot about uh, currently in the marketplace about how, you know, they think CrossFit is fading or, or going. And I think it's just, no, this is the evolution. It's actually becoming the more important thing, yeah. which is the it is the epicenter of all these different things. Right. Because if you if you do a good job on the foundation, someone may go and start applying it to a specific sport or whatever they want to do with it. Yep. But you can still keep training them for that. And then their interests shift. And guess what? You get to continue training them because the core is the same. Yeah. Look, you hear the buzz all the time, like, right? There's a consolidation phase or mm -hmm. things are fading a little bit. I would argue it's a normal business cycle. That's like, it. You can only grow natural so evolution. much this big. And, you know, there's always that natural time where you have to take a step back, reassess. You know, there's other, there's other, there's other factors there, right? Like it's a CrossFit's a business too. You yeah. know, headquarters is a business too. Like they've got things that they've got to manage and, you know, they're also held to a, a different standard that, you know, we as CrossFitters don't know and we don't know, you know, some of the things that they're working on. So I would say that, you know, people that are saying CrossFit's fading a little bit, your perception is just a little off. It's just going through a normal business cycle. Mm -hmm. It's almost like they've got to have that healthy reset where it's like, okay, we got to take a step back, see who we who, see who we are. Just like most business cycles, that consolidation is usually followed by a pretty massive spike in growth again. So mm -hmm. what I would say is for people that think it's fading, you know, it's 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 a recharge as far as I'm concerned. Well, it's, it's, it's also it's, like a, a short-term perspective. Is like people, of course. Sure. People, like, the, the last three years of my life seem like a really big deal to me. Yep. <laughs> yep. But in, like, the grand scheme of things, if I, if I look at, say, the, the fitness industry in the last 20 years, it's yep. gone through massive change. And when you look at that, uh, CrossFit is really, really new still. Yep. And so there's this big explosion, and every time there a new industry emerges, there's a big explosion, and then it contracts a little bit. But uh, the contraction is just cutting away the stuff that it's just the extra, yep. the, the stuff the that's fat. not working as well. You know, and and uh, a lot of people. I mean, you see this, you saw this in tech over the last, you know, thirty years. You see this in uh, like cannabis right now. Yep, uh, is a really big one. Um, where it's still so new that it's it's like the wild west. Yep, mm -hmm. everyone everyone thinks they can do it. Yep, and and a bunch of people step in, which is good because now it it like it creates a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people that like that's their first step into being a business owner. And uh, and when an industry is really new, it's it's kind of easy to get into. Mm -hmm. and it's also easy to get eaten 
really yeah. fast. <laughs> and so, and so I think what's hap- you know, definitely what's happening right now is it's just a maturity. It's the evolution. Yeah. You know, we're, we're maturing. Things have to become more professional. And any consolidation that's happening is you're not seeing the really professional businesses, you know, the, the really professional gyms going out of business mm-hmm. or being sold. Mm-hmm. It's the ones that people were like, oh, yeah, I'll do this as a hobby on the side in addition to working my job. Yep. Those are the ones that are going out of business or being sold or something like that. So the people who take it really seriously, which which makes it good for everybody. Right. And then two or three years from now, when we look at the entire marketplace again, it's going to be even better. Yeah. Higher quality. It, well, allow, it allows everything to get better, right? Yeah. It, it forces those who want to make this a long-term thing to step up and, and really be the evolution. Those that are the part-timers are not that serious are going to fall off just by default because you're not going to be able to compete with that. Yep. It's going to give that contraction, which is going to be that reset around quality. And then now you have the next longer cycle that's mm-hmm. going to come in of, of maturation in this in this space, which is, again, this is now sets up the longer cycles to follow. It's a, it's a, it's a constant growth, you know, contract, growth, contract. I mean, yeah. give Glassman credit. He said it in video. You can go back and look at old videos where he's like, dude, the cream will rise to the top. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, the cream rises to the top, the rest gets pushed away, and then the reset happens, right? So what I would say to people, though, is don't be discouraged in terms of pursuing your passions in this space. There's plenty of opportunity because everyone kind of, everyone, I believe, could benefit, you know, from functional fitness, CrossFit, you know, the, the, the opportunity is still there. So if, if you're a young entrepreneur and you're saying, hey, I've got this idea, don't be discouraged, don't be discouraged by it. Mm-hmm. You know, find a community within your community of like-minded people, vet the idea out, and go test it. Because I still think there's plenty yeah. of opportunity there, and I think there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of chance for, for, for up-and-comers to, to build business. Yeah, the, the, I talk to new box owners every single day yeah. that are getting started and like, hey, do you, is this still a good time to do it? And I'm like... If you're going to create a great product or a great business, if that's what you're after, if you're looking for like a silver bullet, short-term, part-time thing, probably not. Yep. But if you want to build something awesome, absolutely. It's 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 a great time. It's still actually really young in the bigger picture. Yep. Get into it. Make a name for yourself. Build something great. And it's not a question. Just learn from what's already happened. That's all I tell you. But go in wholeheartedly. Yeah. Go, right? You got to like, go in all the yeah. way. Dude, nothing, nothing will ruin a business than the founder of that business not having a passion for that business. Because... Look, you're going to have hard times. You are going to have days where you are like, I don't know if I can open my doors. Those are the those are what my dad used to call the character test. It's this it's that gut in your feeling, you wake up, you don't know how you're gonna make next payroll. That's when you find the true nature of of, of that person. You gotta stand up, you gotta be passionate, you gotta fight for it. And that will be something that your customer senses and feels and they wanna be a part of it and they wanna help you. Mm-hmm. Like I, I can't imagine the amount of times I've actually gone to a gym and been like I mean, you guys have all seen it. The members want to be supportive of that coach in, in all sorts of ways. Like, we want to throw events for you. We want to do this. We want to provide you product or we want to put a TV on the wall or whatever it is. Like, that community is there to support you so long as you're passionate about that community. Mm-hmm. I would argue the ones that, that alienate their community, those will be the guys that, 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 that fall out the fastest. You know? I, I was actually on a call with a, uh, a, a, an affiliate owner yesterday. Yep. And as we were on our call, we had an hour set aside for our call. We're about 20 minutes in. He's like, hold on. Something really weird is going on. My staff and a bunch of members are, like, giving me this weird look from across, like, hold on. Can you hold for me a second? Sure, no problem. He goes out. The entire gym was hiding around the corner. They had gotten this, like, $800, like, rack set up for him for the gym as a gift for Christmas. And they oh, surprised nice. him while we're on it. Me, oh, wow. As he's telling me about, like, his story and everything, and I'm like, dude, that right there already tells me that what you're doing, yep. you're doing right. Yep. So we just need to amplify that, yeah, right? Nice. And it's it was just such a cool thing to actually literally be, like, hearing it happen in the background, like, people cheering and people going nuts. And it was just – it was a really cool thing. It just – for me, when I'm when I'm talking to these people, it's way more a vetting process of like how serious are you about building a great business, yep. and versus someone being like, yeah, I'm just looking for the next excuse for me to blame something on. Yeah, and and right? I th- that's a dangerous cycle. It's a yeah. dangerous cycle. Yeah. You know, my one of my, <laughs> my my uncle lives out in Colorado, and he started an electrician company and built it from scratch, and went from you know one guy to ten guys to a hundred guys, and. And, you know, the one thing he, he, he's always kind of instilled in, in, in our family is like, look, you're building not just a bunch of employees, you're building a community. And I would argue the same is true for a box. When you build that community and you make them part of the experience and you make them part of that, you know, I don't think box owners understand that 
the community aspect of a gym is just as important as the physical benefit that they're getting over a long-term period. Mm -hmm. People want that community. And in a time that we're rushing so fast, I think we talked this morning about as we build a business and we're doing these things, I'm taking 18 hours a day. If that one hour a day is the, the time I get to, com to, to have camaraderie with a group of people, that's a very, very important thing in today's society. It's, it's I get to have that camaraderie. I get that team effort. I have a community that's supporting me in my goals. That's a hugely, hugely potent thing mm -hmm. for people. So if you're if you're working on that, and back to my uncle, his whole thing was, I have employees. Let's make them pro let's make them profit share. If you make people part of the experience, and I'm not telling box owners to go share your profits with these people, but if you make them part of your family, then your family is always going to be there to support you. If they feel like it's a family, they're gonna mm -hmm. they're going to defend it aggressively. They're going to make sure that that business thrives because they want it. It becomes part of their daily routine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's a very, very important aspect that most new box owners don't understand. Some of the older veterans, they get it. And those are the ones that you've seen flourish. Like the community is, it becomes family. And when, when you have a family, you protect it. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, speaking of family, I, I, feel like, I feel like you're a very fortunate individual to have a dad who was an entrepreneur. you got this uncle who is... is um, you know, building a company with hundreds of employees and whatnot. Like, yeah. I didn't really have that growing up. I didn't have any entrepreneurial uh, influence at all. I didn't even know it was, like, even possible to be an entrepreneur until I was, like, deep into my 20s almost. Yep. And so I, I've always uh, – kind of like you see kids now that are, like, starting CrossFit and they're like, they're, like, 12 years old or, like, 10 years old, and you're like, man, I wish I could have started when I was your age, <laughs> that, that type of thing. Like, yeah. um, having, having not started uh, – my entrepreneurial journey until late in my twenties, uh, I always I always think people are super lucky when they when they started super early. So, uh, knowing that you have two kids, I have two kids. Marcus, you have a son as well. Um, Cameron Harold, uh, the guy that's kind of well known for taking uh, one eight hundred got junk from seven figures uh, up in, up to nine figures as as their COO, I believe. He did a cool TED talk a while back about how to teach kids to be entrepreneurs. Uh, certainly, you know, school systems and a lot of people who have never been an entrepreneur, they teach their kids how to be employees. They teach their kids how to just follow instructions and just do what you're told, etc. Et so, um, I'm curious from your perspective, having had a dad who was an entrepreneur and being an entrepreneur yourself, like how how are you? in your mind, gonna, gonna choose to, to raise your kids to think about being an entrepreneur since a, a very young age? So it, it, it's funny you ask. I actually just had this conversation the other day. Um, the straight lessons with my two boys, Gavin and Bodie, uh, they're not taken to them quite well. And it's, it's like, hey, here's how you make 15 cents out of five. Here's how you do this. Those lessons, and I, and I think back to when my dad was teaching me these things. I don't think my dad actually said, hey, dude, here's the lesson for you. He was the guy that was like, I'm throwing you right in. And so when he would put us to work, it was you're going in the back and you're doing logistics and you're working with the guys back there and you're going to, you're going to load boxes and you're going to learn what it's like to be those guys. And then you're going to go work with these other guys. Not, none of them glamorous jobs, like none of it. Like it was, it was, you're going to go and do every job here. And if I hear one complaint or if the guy comes and tells me you didn't do a good job, you know, you got to understand that you're fired. You're dude, one hundred percent. One hundred percent. Like my dad's whole thing was, you know what the squeaky wheel gets? Booted. Adopted. Like it's just yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like so 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 that was the joke of the house. But it's funny, it's like my dad taught me at a very young age that and th there's a reason we don't really do titles at the office. And like I'm not a big title guy, I never have been. I feel that everyone in the office in in an office, there is no I will never look down at someone and say, hey, you go do this for me. It just doesn't, it's not my DNA because I was taught that every person at a company is just as important as everyone else. The guy doing logistics is just as important as the CFO because if the box doesn't get out, you don't need a CFO anyways, right? So so from my, from my standpoint in terms of learning, it was trial by fire. Get in there and I'm watching you and if you don't, if you don't associate, like you, you, t you, know, you treat people poorly, I'm going to know about it. You're going to hear about it. And it was very much like that's what that was what was ingrained is is you go in there and you respect everyone. And too many times today you see, um, you know, I, I hate the term C-suite. It, it, it bothers me. I, I, I get it. Like I understand like mm -hmm. corporate structures built that way. But look at the guys that are hugely successful. Like Hobie Darling, I used to go out to Skull Candy. He sits on our advisory board. Hobie's desk was dead in the middle of Skull Candy. And when I walked Skull Candy with him and like we'd walk around, like he knew every single person's name. We must have walked by 200 people, every single one he knew and everyone knew him and he made himself accessible. And, you know, he never, you know, he, he basically put himself out there as, look, I'm just like you guys. I'm, we're here to drive a business and we're here to drive value. And so, you know, back to your main point is how do you learn about entrepreneurship? You, you go in, you 
try every aspect of the business, yeah. respect every aspect of the business, treat everyone as you'd want to be treated. And I think you'll learn quite a bit really quick. Mm-hmm. You know, it's understanding what people are going through to, to achieve their goal within that structure. It, it's the best way to learn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. One really interesting part of the, that TED talk is he, uh, he, Cameron was saying that with his kids, he didn't do uh, chores where like, okay, like you take out the trash, you get a dollar or, you know, like where you just like a basic allowance of like, you do this and I give you money. Mm-hmm. Instead, he kind of, he kind of flipped it where it's, it's more entrepreneurial where the kids don't have a, a set chore to do for a set amount of money where they're trading dollars for hours or, or, or their work for a certain paycheck, so to speak, where instead the, the kids would, he encouraged them to just you know, go around the house or the yard or whatever and find something that needs to be fixed or find a problem to be solved and then they negotiate the price. Yep. And they've they've done that now since they were, you know, ten years old. Yep. And that, that that negotiation, finding finding a problem in the market, finding something to solve, a problem to solve and then and then negotiating a price for it is a skill that most kids do not get. So I, that that was one example that I remember tangibly that I was like, damn, I'm really gonna do that with, with, with my kids in, in some in some facet where uh, they'll understand how to negotiate and talk to an adult about money from a very young age. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it's there's one thing my my son Bodie's not ready for it yet, but Gavin and I, whenever he <clears> kind of <throat> starts to whine or complain a little bit, I look at him and I say, "Hey, there's two types of people in the world: there's problem solvers and problem creators. Which one are you?" And he's now going, "I'm a problem solver. I'm a problem solver. I'm a problem solver." So mm-hmm. the cool thing is Legos. Does anyone? You Dude, the I, yeah, <laughs> Dude. It's like, that's like our number one go-to. Legos. <laughs> it's, it's it's always Taco Tuesday every night of the week. In my, in my <laughs> um, but it's funny, like he's now getting to that point where we've got the Legos that used to be something, and now they're not anything. And he's like, "Hey, I want to I want to build it back into that thing." And I look at him, I'm like, "So how are you going to do it? Mm-hmm. Did you save the book? Are we going to find those pieces? Or you can get creative and create your own thing." Mm-hmm. And well, Dad, will you help me? No, no, this is you. You got to do this. So this is your problem. You got to solve it. What do you want to solve it with? What do you want to create? Start creating. Nothing's wrong. Just start creating. So, yeah, I, I, I think he's got a pretty solid point with that, and mm-hmm. it's it's instilling them that they have the power to do things. I think that you know, as as a young parent, I look. I got spanked as a kid. It happened. Love my parents. Don't look at them as bad people. Um, I've always been kind of taught, like, you just got to do it. And, like, the more help you give the kids, I actually think you're doing a little bit of a disservice to them. Mm-hmm. You know, I've always, like, when they learn it on their own, I think they get ingrained with way better habits as opposed to, you know, someone constantly reaching out. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a valid point, and we're trying to instill it. We're, it, 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 it's a daily education. Yeah. yeah. I had a similar yeah. upbringing to you where my, my parents both owning service businesses mm-hmm. I was always a part of it yep. and they'd always just give me jobs to do and they would always basically just assume that I could do it. They'd be like, okay, so you're going to go and you need to find 50 people to sign up for this thing. And I'd be like, well, what do I do? And they'd give me like the quick pep talk, like this, 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 if this happens, call me and I'll help you. Okay, go. I'll see you in a few hours. Yep. And it'd be like, uh, okay. But you just start getting comfortable with like figuring shit out. Yeah. And I just, I, as you're saying this stuff, it's all like kind of like washing over me. I'm thinking back, I'm like, I didn't even realize what they were doing, but they were doing the same thing where they were just like, no, you can, you're going to learn how to do all of it. And like, I remember being like 14 years old and my dad's like, okay, you're going to go vacuum cars in the back of the car wash. And that's what you're going to do all day. And he's like, and then he'd come back and be like, Hey, we're only getting eight through in an hour. You need to make that 12. And I'm like, well, how do I do that? And he's just like, figure it out. Walks back to the front and I'm like, oh crap. All right. Well, um, we would skip that part and you start getting creative. It just, I think. Hey it guys, comes... start cutting corners. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Vacuum shittier. Go faster. <laughs> <laughs> but you, but you experiment, right? Yeah. So you try stuff like that. Then dad comes back. He's like, I just got four customer complaints about you guys doing a shitty job back here. What did you do? Oh, you said you do, you know, do it faster. And it's yeah. like, no, I didn't say do it faster. I said, get more done yeah. in the same time. And you're like, fuck. You know, but you, it, it forces you to kind of, re, kind of learn these these concepts around quality or speed or creativity or, uh, I'm as you're telling me all this, it's yeah. like totally kind of coming back to me. That's get, really cool. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. For sure. Right. That's what it's all about. And, you know, look, I, I, the idea of speed, like there's that one thing going around on social. It's just like, you can get it fast, but it's not going to be good. Mm-hmm. You can get it good, but it's not going to be fast, right? Like there's that whole idea that, look, things take time, and 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 the only time you grow is when you're uncomfortable mm-hmm. and when you get put in front of a situation and it's just like figure it out and mm-hmm. when someone comes in and immediately starts to help you that person is 
in my opinion, handicapping you from seeing that growth because, you know, you achieving the goal and those even as, as small as the milestone may be, it's still your milestone. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and so I think those are important. Cool. Uh, before we wrap up the show, I, I'd love to hear what is uh, kind of in store for 2017 for you guys. Yeah, so we've got some really great things happening uh, 2017. We've got uh, some new app updates that are going to be coming out that we think are going to be pretty groundbreaking uh, that, that you'll see. And it's going to really open up um, the idea of how you use the, uh, the, the powered out device. We've got some big athletes coming on board that you'll see. We're really going to be expanding that universe, talking about some of the other people that use the device and how they use fitness to, to explore their passions. And we've got a really great team that is coming on board uh, uh, to work with us. We've got some pretty exciting stuff going and we'll, you know, we'll still be doing the rounds with, with, uh, with the regionals and games and, you know, participating in as much as we can with regard to the open but you know we're looking forward to to a pretty successful 2017 and continuing to provide value to our end users and really building out the power dot ecosystem and, and, and putting that out to the broader community if people want to follow you guys i'm assuming it what just power dot dot com so we're at my power dot so it's at my power dot dot com uh, on instagram it up. yeah it's okay uh <laughs> we're still trying to buy power dot from someone up in up in the Eastern Block, but uh, it's mypowerdot.com. Uh, the, the the website's mypowerdot.com, and we're launching a new site uh, January one, which will be powerdot.com, and that will be our global site. So that will be launching uh, that'll be launching January one with a bunch of fresh content, and we're mm -hmm. gonna be we're gonna be spooning out content on a weekly basis. So we got some real exciting stuff happening there. Yeah, very cool. forward to it. Cool, thanks yeah. guys. Thanks, thanks for coming on. Thanks. Appreciate it.